Hi there, Bob Zito from Trinity Church, Asheville. The theme for today's gospel reading is eschatology. Eschatology is the theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. Another phrase for eschatology is end times. We are approaching the end of the liturgical year. The gospel theme for the second to last Sunday for each liturgical year always concerns eschatology. This precedes the final Sunday of the liturgical year on which we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. The Sunday after that starts the new liturgical year with the season of Advent. Eschatology is often linked with an apocalypse. The word apocalypse means to uncover or reveal. It's a belief in divine disclosures made through the agency of angels, dreams, and visions, often leading to an eschatological crisis where cosmic powers of evil are destroyed and the cosmos is restored. John Collins writes, an apocalypse is intended to interpret present earthly circumstances in light of the supernatural world and the future to influence both understanding and the behavior of the audience by means of divine authority. Jewish apocalyptic literature was at its height between 300 and 100 BCE during the Hellenistic period when the Greeks were the rulers of Palestine. The Jews were a conquered people, first by the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and finally the Romans. By the time of the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE, the Jews had longed to be delivered from occupation and to have Israel restored to Davidic rule. It was the Messiah, the Anointed One, who was to do this. They believed the Messiah would be a warrior king, just like King David, who defeated the Philistines by force. So you can see the relationship between the apocalyptic reading of the end of times and next Sunday celebration of Christ the King when we celebrate a new time in the future of the all-embracing authority of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. Of course, we don't know how this is to happen, but there are theories of what the signs might be as referred to in today's reading. Wars, earthquakes, and famines. Well, we've had numerous wars, earthquakes, and famines, and they should tell us not to read scripture too literally. The gospel reading opens with the disciples leaving the temple in awe of its great size. Jesus comments that not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 CE or AD, the culmination of the Jewish-Roman War or Great Revolt that started four years earlier in 66 CE or AD. This passage helps us to date gospel, uh, Mark's gospel to after 70 CE, as most scholars, most scholars agree that the destruction of the temple could not have been predicted due in part to its massive dimensions. It was thought to be indestructible due to its immense size. In fact, the Romans were unable to completely destroy the temple as a portion of it still remains to this day in the form of the Western or Wailing Wall. Destruction of the temple was devastating to the Jews. In the book Jerusalem, written by Simon Sebag Montefiore, the carnage of the Jewish wars and the destruction of Jerusalem and its beloved temple are explained in excruciating detail. When it came to war, the Romans weren't very nice people. They took war and conquest very seriously. By 70 CE, the Romans had had it with the Jews and their rebellions. To prove their point, they flattened Jerusalem beyond all recognition. On top of the rubble, they built a Roman city with Roman architecture. Today, you can still see some of the architecture built by the Emperor Hadrian. While he eliminated the teaching of Torah and the practice of Jewish customs, flattening the city was his most radical measure of putting it to the Jews. He even renamed the city to Aelia Capitolina after his own family. Jerusalem was no more. Imagine what that must have been like. Imagine what it would have been like if Asheville were utterly and completely destroyed by some terrible holocaust. 
Imagine the sorrow, the hurt, the agony of it all. Imagine what the Jews believed was the message in all this. Imagine what the Jews thought about their future. On 9-11, 2001, I lived about five blocks north of the World Trade Center. I was in midterm, in Midtown at the time, and I immediately rushed to my church, knowing that pe people would want to pray and be comforted by the event. I had been ordained barely four months. When Dana and I were allowed back to our apartment several days later, I was shocked by the extent of the destruction. Gray ash covered all of the nearby buildings and the streets, and like the aftermath of a snowstorm, the city was eerily quiet. There was no traffic, and the only pedestrians were residents of the immediate area going about their business in solemn quietness. Our business was throwing out the contents of the refrigerator and packing up some clothes as we were forced to find another place to live for several weeks. In walking up Broadway with Dana and our rolling luggage, I looked around at the damage and the devastation, thinking to myself that I had never seen pictures like this before, at least not of New York. I'd seen pictures of Dresden, of London during World War II, but I never thought I would see something like this in the United States. Like the ancient Jews of Jerusalem, I wondered what God was trying to say through it all. I found it difficult to put my arms around it. I still do. When we moved back into our apartment, our neighborhood was inundated by the Army National Guard and the first responders who were continuing to look for human remains among the wreckage of the buildings. They called it the pile. I wondered where God was to have allowed such a tragedy. I found God there, near the pile. I found God in the face of all this tragedy. God was revealed in the faces of all those first responders. Night after night, I saw them walking home from the pile, dirty and exhausted and never complaining. They were dragging themselves home at night and then back again in the morning in their relentless search. What this said to me was that no matter what tragedy strikes, no matter how horrific the times seem to be, God is there to comfort us and to show us a way out. We are a resurrection people. God is always showing us ways to reinvent ourselves, especially during times of hardship and tragedy. There are always new beginnings at the end of every chapter in life. We need to follow in the direction that the Spirit leads us. If we keep our faith, if we keep our life in prayerful contemplation, God revealed solutions. This never comes in the form of an email or a text. In our current age of technology, we become too accustomed to getting immediate answers to our questions in life. Answers from God are never that immediate. God answers comes with time and only after constant prayer and contemplation. Nor are these answers in writing. They come in the form of a sense of things, a realization, an intuition, if you would. These intuitions bring us closer to God and aligns us with God's will for us. As we come to the close of our liturgical year, let us strive to grow closer to God in faithfulness and action with the assurance that God is there along the way. Remember what Jesus told us, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age.